Father's Day. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Happy Father's Day. Great to be a father. Great to be a father. I'll tell you, every phase of life gets better and better and better. Remember when you were in middle school and you were scared to go to high school? Yeah. But it was better. <laughs> middle school was crazy. <laughs> then after high school, then college, and that was even better in high school, and then, then you graduate, and then you get married, that was way much better than being single. And then you move on, have children, become a father, and that's way better than no children. And then just every stage is just better than the stage before. God is good. Amen? All time. I think if you have the right attitude, you can look for the best in things, you know. I choose to be happy. Uh, how many fathers do we have in the building? A few of you. Uh, how many wish you were fathers? Raise your hands. <laughs> we're going to have a single meeting after no. Uh, how many fathers have more than six children? Six or more children? Raise your hands. Oh, Jerry! Jerry Jones, you productive man. <laughs> How many grandchildren do you have? 21. 21 Woo! grandchildren. Wow. Look, look at him. He's happy. <laughs> How many great grandchildren? Uh, four. Four? Wow. That's awesome. Wow. Does anybody have five children? Any five? Yes, right there. Good. Rich. Okay, how many have four children? Right back there, right up here. All right, that's good. Good for you. Four. Uh, three children. Ooh, a lot of people. How many had two children? Okay, my hand goes up there. You guys said, I'm going to have a boy and a girl, and that's enough. So how many have one children? You had one children said, never again. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, happy Father's Day. It's good to have you. I just got two quick announcements. Um, the uh, Vacation Bible School. Now, let me see. We're going to have a missions meeting right after this service. If you want to go to Brussels, Belgium and help build a church, how many want to go to Brussels, Belgium and help build a church? It's going to be fantastic. Do you know they actually eat waffles? Belgian waffles? No lie. They walk around the street with waffles hanging out of their mouth. Man, it's just... Okay, so we're going to have a missions trip in October, the end of October into November. For that trip to Belgium, we're going to have another trip to Italy. It's a women's conference, women only. They're going to do a women's conference. And so if you want to go to either of those trips, come to the meeting right after the service. And then this Wednesday, we're having a meeting for Camparama. Camparama. And if, you, if your kids are going to Camparama, with the Royal Rangers. It happens every four years, and there's thousands of kids that camp, and it's just fantastic. Then you need to come to the meeting Wednesday night after church. All this week, we're doing Vacation Bible School here at the church. So it is fantastic. So you've seen some decorations. If you need to sign your kids up, sign your kids up. If you want to be a helper, we need your help. And volunteer, and it's just all kinds of things to do, from helping the kids with snacks to doing the music and dancing part of it. It's just all kinds of fun stuff to do. So Vacation Bible School, Jonathan and Nicole are doing that. Right now, they're up in the Children's Church doing children, Children's Church. So they're doing a great job. Um, we're going to start the service off today by having a round table discussion on the stage. Live, live round table discussion with uh, some great fathers. So Tim Thurman, come on up. Tim. All right, Tim. And then Leo Sisko. Leo. Okay. My voice is not warmed up. Matt Clark. Matt. And last, but surely not least, Mike. Jablonski! Mike, come on up! Alright. Does everybody have a microphone? Okay. Here, take that one. Alright. 
Do we have a handheld mic tray anywhere around? Oh, here it is. Oh, good. Testing, testing. There you go. All right, how are you guys doing? Okay, let's go down the road. <laughs> Looks like he's ready to rap. <laughs> you can break out and some rap freestyle if you want to. Okay, so uh, just tell us your name and uh, how long you've gone to the church and what you do for a living. Well, most of you know me as MJ, but it's Michael Chiblonsky, which is why most people call me MJ. Chiblonsky's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, I've been coming to this church for two years now. And I work for Rob Gary over at uh, Distributor Appliance Incorporated, or Parts Incorporated. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Matt Clark, been coming here two, about two and a half years now. Uh, my wife Bree and I, she had to work today, unfortunately, so that's why she's not here. But uh, currently out of Herbert, uh, AC-130 uh, gunship pilot. So you guys hear the gunship shooting, that's usually me out there keeping you all weekend. Hey, I'm uh, Leo Sisko. Um, been coming here, was coming here off and on for about a year, and then really got into it um, uh, late last year, early this year. Um, and uh, I was unemployed for a while, but uh, I just got on with Sierra Nevada uh, Corporation. So. Yay. Tim Thurman, I. Uh, I, I oh. Just turn it on. There's a little button. Push it on. It's on. Okay. 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 Crank it away. Um, I uh, I own and operate teach uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for a living um, down here in the bar, and uh, awesome. I've been going here about four years, I think. Awesome. Like that. <laughs> He's my secret bodyguard, so <laughs> don't make any sudden moves towards me. Um, so I picked some really godly, manly fathers today because uh, they're going to preach our sermon part of it today and uh, so let me ask you a question name one or two ways your life has been changed in a good way by going to church I'll tell you what, I'll start that one off <laughs> um, when I when I first when I first started coming to church I, I was very arrogant um, but uh, a lot of things happened in my life uh, that made me struggle and it humbled me and um, it made me realize the things that I had, the things that I took for granted, everything that I had lost, um, it, it drew me closer, it drew me closer to God and uh, I, I give all my thanks to Him because uh, it, he's, he's shown me how little you can have but at the same time how much you have. So it, it's, it, it was humbling and um, it brought me so much closer to him. Yes, and then, and then can I just add a little bit? He started coming to church and then they went through a divorce and then he lost his job. I mean, everything was thrown at this man and he started coming to church and then um, he got a great job and he's still coming to church and he still comes to prayer meeting on Saturday afternoon at four just faithful, loyal. So he's not one of those fly-by-night Christians, I need Jesus when things are bad, and when things are good, stop going to church. So he's doing awesome, I'm proud of you. Yeah, so how's it changed? <laughs> the reason why I ask this question is a lot of men don't feel it's necessary to go to church. That's for women and children. But um, how's it changed you guys? I, I look back and I'm like, I don't know, how I got by before. Mm. You know, most of y'all saw my testimony here a few months back. I lost my mom when I was 13, and I basically turned my mom, or just turned my back on God when I lost my mom, and went into college and boozing and drinking and partying and, and kind of living that lifestyle. And it wasn't until pilot training that uh, a friend of mine just, hey, you want to go to church with me? Just kept asking me over and over. And finally, I was like, all right, fine. And uh, so I go in that day, and the uh, message that day was the prodigal son. And I, I mean, it hit me like a ton of bricks. It's like, all right, I got, I got the message you got to do. I mean, it's talking right to him. And since then, uh, you know, I've stumbled a few times. We all do. Um, but I, I look back and I'm just like, I don't even know how I got by. 
uh, before church, you know, and I can't even imagine a life without God and a life without a church family. Cool. You know, it's just, and every and every week I learn something new from awesome. somebody, and it's just awesome. Awesome, awesome. That's good. <laughs> Um, for me, it's, uh, you know, as most of you know, I grew up Catholic, so, and, you know, how Pastor always talks about, or even the Word talks about how, uh, you know, if you're being taught incorrectly and how he's held higher to a higher standard than, than we are because we're the ones who are learning. So for him to be a dedicated man, Pastor Ron, Pastor Trey, and, you know, Greg, um, for me it changed because I was so lost and um, these men are responsible for rejuvenating me and refreshing my spirit and just bringing me back to life and you know I'm extremely proud to say that I'm a new creation now you know it's just like the word says you totally change and for me <clears throat> when I was struggling with the stronghold of doubt you know not knowing what was what and uh, it just sent me into you know depressive state I didn't know you know like Matt was saying you, you, you're just lost and you don't know how you get by without God, and it's it's very uh, discouraging. So when I started coming here, you know, the first person that I got into was Greg, and you know, I sat directly in line with him, and like Matt, you know, just that that message connected with me as it does with each and every one of you. However, your life was changed, and you know, suffering from depression, I don't. I don't even think about being depressed anymore. And a lot of you who know me here, I'm super chippy or super chipper, happy. I'm all, hey, you guys. Are. And you know, it would it'd be hard to believe that somebody like me contemplated suicide many, many times. You know, and it, it's um, it's very sad. But all the glory goes to God now because I don't suffer from any depression, no anger, no anything. I'm I'm completely a renewed and refreshed human being. I'm totally new in the spirit. I love it. It's Feeling uh, uh, renewed and refreshed, I, I agree to that, you know. Um, if I miss a Sunday, I just, uh, man, I, you know, when I get back and just hearing the word uh, from pastor, just fellowshipping with uh, you guys in the church, and uh, I just feel renewed and refreshed, ready to, you know, take on another week. So, so you say church is wor worth it? Uh, it's, it's it's necessary every day every Sunday. okay let me ask you this what misconceptions do men have about church the god and the bible what are some of the misconceptions that your friends maybe at work have about church and god or the bible i would like to go first if you don't mind um, again going back to my you know background i just had a conversation with my father yesterday and he's he still struggles with truth like you know anytime i talk about the bible he's a you're preaching again in my house you're preaching again i'm like i'm not preaching i'm just talking the truth that's what god's word is and because he is so caught up in catholicism you know ignorance is one of our biggest downfalls you know if you don't know you're you're losing the battle automatically right off the bat and because he has trouble um, accepting the truth because he doesn't read the Bible, he doesn't get into it. He just, you know, it feels that man wrote the Bible and it wasn't God. And I try to explain to him, no, it was written through the Holy Spirit. That's what how it was written. You know, ah, whatever. And you know, I, I don't doubt my father. I know he believes in God. I know he believes in Jesus. But you know, we had the whole sermon where there's a difference between following and believing. If you're following, believing is automatic. You know, if you're if you're living your life every day. You know, at following him, making sure you remember what that cross is all about. <clears throat> you know, again, you'll be renewed every day. So it's pinnacle to be in church for, for me, and I know it is this way for you, and I know that we all know people that, you know, think church is secondary. Man, the more you make church secondary, the more weak you become. When you come here, you're reinforced every time, every time, because you can walk out of here every Sunday and just feel awesome. Challenged. Yep. Challenged, yeah. Cool. Misconceptions that men might have about church it's for whims. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the biggest misconceptions that I've seen is that if uh, a lot of people think that Christians, in order to be Christian, you have to be perfect. 
and uh, at least for me, the, the, and that's why I stopped going to church for many years because I always thought it was very hypocritical. But you know, coming to realize that you know you, it, it's not it's not about being perfect. It's about praising who is perfect and who uh, you know someone someone who can help you. You know, you know, uh, yeah. Because uh, growing up, you know, the my, my biggest misconception was okay. So that's how that's how everybody is. Everybody's perfect. But now, you know, I I, I strive to be perfect and to live the way that God wants us to. And that uh, that is the, the biggest one for me is that it. it Everybody's life is pretty much a lie. Tell, Tim, tell us about the difference between religion and relationship. I think that might be a misconception people have. Why do I need church? You know. Yeah, my, my dad has said many times that uh, church is just filled with a bunch of broken people. And, uh, you know, that's why we just we need this relationship with the Lord because um, I mean there's no way to earn it. There's no way it's impossible. Yeah. I mean if we even if we had to earn it for one day, just one day, we couldn't do it. Yeah, I right. couldn't do it. So it's about a relationship with yeah. the Lord. It's not about religion and yeah. doing religious things. Yeah, I think a lot of people think oh, I don't want to go add something else to my life that's going to take up time. I'm too busy as it is. I don't need religion, you know. But it's more than that, isn't it? Yeah, an example I use quite a bit um, is when Brian and I talk, having that relationship that you're talking about, you know, it's just like my marriage to her. This ring symbolizes that I'm married to her. But if I don't actively put forth effort into that marriage, this means absolutely nothing. Wow. Just like when we get baptized, you know, you can get baptized and say that you're that showing your outward faith in God and you've accepted Him as your Lord and Savior. But if you stop at that mm. and you don't put any effort into that relationship, right. it's kind of the same thing the way I look at it. So um, just because you get baptized or just because you have a ring on your finger doesn't mean you're going to have a good marriage or have a good relationship with God. It takes effort. And right. without that effort, uh, you know, that's a struggle I'm having with my parents right now um, is they're under the, the belief that once you're baptized, you're automatically saved. I don't necessarily believe that. If you don't put the effort into that relationship with God, even though you're baptized, right. are you going to get into heaven? If, you know, if I did not put any effort into my relationship with God, if I died today, would I go to heaven? I don't, you know. Right. Right. So that's kind of the way I, that uh, when Bree and I talk about it, try to talk about it with other people, is building not just religion, yeah, going to church on Wednesday and Sunday, that's kind of the, I guess, the religious part of it, but you have to act out on it, act on it and build that relationship in relationship addition to it with yeah. the Lord. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Well, I want to show you guys a video, then I want to get your thoughts on it. Do we have time for a video? You do? Okay, let's turn the lights out, and uh, I'm going to move out of the way so people can see. You guys stay there where you're at.
sure didn't the Almighty send me to watch your back? I didn't like him anyway. He wasn't right in the head. All right, I love it. He wasn't right in the head. Did you hear catch the line? He said, the Almighty sent me to watch your back. The Almighty sent me to watch your back. Now, what's the Christian, the spiritual uh, parallel of this? What, what do you think that relates to Christians? First of all, I think we can all agree it's the greatest movie ever made. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I think there's so much meaning uh, to our uh, honest. I see so much um, in that movie to our Christian walk, and I could go on for about an hour on that. But um, and just one thing comes to mind for me is uh, sometimes we don't. Uh, we don't know someone's intention. Maybe um, we think that maybe they're coming to harm us when they're actually coming to help us. And so you give them a chance, um, like William gave gave his man a chance to uh, not kill him and save his life. Yeah. I don't know. That's what it kind of. Because he didn't fire the arrow. He could have shot him, shot and him. Uh, he paused and trusted him for a second, and then he saved his life. Oh, so. That's good. I don't know. That just kind of awesome. spoke that to me right there. Trusting your brothers. Yes. It's important. Man, how many brothers don't have somebody to protect them? I mean, it's a tendency, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a tendency of men. We like to isolate ourselves and pull away from the body of Christ. Well, I don't need anybody. I don't need any help. I can do it on my own. You know, we're so self-reliant. But in reality, everybody needs somebody to to watch their back. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think it's, uh, again, you know, not to use the word again, but I think it's pinnacle, you know, uh, for my start here, uh, if anybody knows, knows Josh Brianon, and I know some of you have heard the story before, but, you know, God crossed our paths and we were both um, sharpening each other. God was using us to build each other up and to, you know, set each other on his way you know josh has moved on to another state now of course you know i miss him like crazy because that was my my go-to man but we always start new relationships here at church you know just like this meeting right here you know if you're not everybody here is struggling everybody here is struggling I, some of us you know are are deeper into it which is really good and some of us have the strength to you know share with somebody else who is feeling weaker but I'm pretty, I, I think it's safe to say that the majority of us here are struggling. It's an everyday battle, it really is. But we go to him in our time of weakness because that's where strength comes in. And when you have your brothers or your sisters around sharpening you, even if you go, hey, Pastor, I, I need prayer, you don't even have to tell them what it is because God already knows. All he has to do is say, MJ is struggling, Lord, please watch out for him. You already know what he needs. And just that little small step, that little inch, that little micro, whatever you want to call it, it's, it's just, it echoes in heaven. And God will act on it. He will move on that. And all of us here are, are, all of you, you've been, you know, something in your life has changed where you're like, yes, woo! You know what I mean? I mean I'm, not, I'm, I'm not your manly man. I cry at church all the time. I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm thankful. Because when you, when you really break down to it and you think about how God has worked in your life, man, forget it. How, how could you not be, you know, you just look at it, it's awesome. I, I like, tell me, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't God use other men to correct us or speak to us or challenge us or to get us to the next level? Doesn't God do that? Has anybody in this church or any man ever done that to you? Yeah, I was, uh, just the other day, I was able to uh, share my heart with a brother in the church and, um, and share it with him. Um, he helped me immensely, but it turned out that I ended up helping him cool. as well. Cool. So it was, uh, we, we had each other's back. Awesome. So it was, awesome. it, was, it was great. 
Because we have enemies, don't we? And sometimes the enemy is not a person. Sometimes the enemy is alcohol. Or sometimes the enemy could be just stress of life. Or, or if you see a friend, you know, how have you guys maybe spoke truth into somebody's life? Well, I know that um, I used to be, uh, I used to succumb very easily to stress. And uh, I would let little things get to me and I would, I you know, I, I would just, I was a very angry person. But uh, um, coming here actually, it, you, you, Pastor, have and a, a lot of a lot of my brothers and sisters in here have, have shed light upon me, and it's it's really it's brought me peace, and so I, I've been able to actually use that as well, and you know, um, let anybody, uh, specifically my daughter's mom, you know, she because she, she's a stressor as well, and uh, I I. I keep I keep trying to tell her, you know, like just don't worry, like everything is everything is in God's hands. Everything is, you know, what happens in His timing, and um, you know, what whatever whatever He knows is best is uh, you know is, is what is what will happen. But don't don't stress about it. Things, you know, He's He's on He's on your side, you know, and and she she I mean it it it, it calms her down and it really does. It it brings her peace just, just like it still brings me peace right i know for me i always used to be i feel i would feel awkward and scared when trying to talk about god with people and i never really knew why um and some of the people that helped me the most or you know yourself you, you told your testimony here a few months back and that kind of that let me get rid of a 17 year guilt just hearing your testimony and then i'm like i realize the importance of sharing your testimony with people and sharing your story and sharing God to give them the hope to let because it, I mean it set something with me free that day um, you know and this past hunt season going out with Curtis and, and Mike and, and those guys and hunting with them it was more than just a hunting trip you know it was just getting to hang out with godly men and they had a huge impact on me and I still do um, just showing me the ways that uh, I can be better and how that's helped me uh, here a couple months ago, my brother was down and uh, him and his wife are going through divorce right now. Um, and I called him in my office and I shut the door and I'm like sitting there, I'm like, okay, what do I say? What do I say? I was like, Lord, help me here. I, I just let me say the right thing. And I, I just started talking. And you know, before you knew it, two hours went by. And him and I just talking. And, and by the time we were done, um, and he, I mean, he was almost in tears and it wasn't my intent to make him cry, but I was just sharing the Lord with him and I'm like I'm sitting there thinking to myself never in a million years would he and or I ever think we'd be having this conversation you know but it's you know talking you know with, with you pastor and with Mike and, and Curtis it's, it's allowed me to open up and not feel that awkwardness you know just walking up and putting my hand on somebody's shoulder and praying for him out loud I used to be terrified of that and I you know I'll admit, I still get a little bit nervous especially when somebody I don't know but the fact that I can actually do that now Wow. You know, that's how you actually pray for people. Yeah, it's a funny concept, right? <laughs> but uh, you know, just and I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one that struggles with that kind of awkwardness. You're not. But, uh, um, when you can share your testimony, share your story with other people, you, you just don't know what they're going through and what kind of impact you can have and what opportunities you can miss if you don't do it. Wow, that's good. Hey, give the mic back to MJ and let's let him do a beatbox. A beatbox. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, no pressure. You don't have to. Um, the only thing that just came to my head right now is what he was talking about. <clears throat> it's like, I suck at math. So, a picture of a kid who's sitting in a, in, a, in a classroom who needs help with math, or any subject for that matter, and it's, you're afraid to stand out or raise your hand and say, teacher, I need help, I need help. I don't understand how fractions are being multiplied or whatever. And, when you hear another kid say, hey, you know, I need help with that, can you show me again? And then you're so thankful that the teacher's doing it again on the board. You know, as men, like Pastor was saying, we tend to isolate ourselves, and we really do, and it's, you know, coming from my background, you know, being from New York, and, you know, being raised by my father, and how you, you do what you can. You, you know, I was raised to be independent, you know, and um, be self-sufficient. And you, you tend to get into that thought process of I don't need anybody's help and you become very prideful and you don't want to ask for help because you feel like you're weak and as a man 
Many of you here, I'm sure you'll agree with me, you don't want to feel weak, man. You don't want to look weak, especially in front of your wife. And, you know, or your other bros. Who wants to be shown weak in front of your friends, man? Your other guy friends. But um, as a Christian man, you know, I could go to somebody in this church. I know for a fact and be like, hey, man, I'm feeling down. Can you throw a crowd for me? Oh, yeah, MJ, no problem. And, you know, going back to Josh, that's how, you know, we were right away. We would always talk to each other. And even to this day, He'll hit me up in a text message, or I'll hit him up in a text message, or you know Matt or um, uh, Leo. He's come to me before my main man Travis. You know, I'm, we've all done the same things. And Greg, you know, uh, these are just ones off the top of my head right now. But when I get asked, "Hey, we pray for me," or I send that back out, you better believe that those guys that I'm talking to are like, <laughs> "Yes, I will." <laughs> and you don't you don't have to worry about. The, uh, the, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Just being shunned off or, you know, like, what? You need help, man? What? I want to pray for you. But here, you know, everybody's struggle is the same. And when you ask, it's very cool to, you know, be built up because without each other, we're alone. We're easy targets like that deer was. We need to pray for you to come out of your shell. <laughs> It would be scary. It would be the Hulk. <laughs> hey, well, um, did they do good or did they do good? Hey, come on. Okay, thanks, guys. Appreciate you. Do you mind chair? Someone bebox the microphone. <laughs> I think it's just cool. Thanks, brother Tim. Love you. Awesome. That's how you say I love you to a man. <clears throat> when you're a man. When you hug a man, there's a certain way you have to hug him, and when you say I love you, you don't you don't look him in the eye and say, I love you. <laughs> you say, I love you, man. And when you hug, three taps on the back. <laughs> Love you, man. And we all know what you mean. You really care about them. But shouldn't that be what the body of Christ is doing for each other? <clears throat> Men, as much as we think that, we don't, that we're not emotional, like we hear in teaching psychology, women are emotional. Men, you got to look after the emotional needs of your wife. Blah, blah, and you hear that a lot, and so we think, okay, women are emotional, men are not. That's what we tend to believe, but it's not true. <laughs> men have emotions too. They get down and discouraged too. We're going to look at it in the Word here, but I want to tell you a little story about a really manly man named Theodore Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. He went to a campaign stop in Milwaukee in 1912, and when he got there, a man walked up to him with a 32, 32 caliber gun, shot him in the chest. And I guess since it was a 32, maybe he was wearing a jacket or something, it, it penetrated his chest only about two inches. So he gets up before the crowd to speak. He said, I would like to speak a long time, but I've just been shot in the chest, and the bullet is still in me, and so I'm only going to speak a short time. And he went on for 55 minutes. And when he got done, there was a pool of blood at his feet. His own blood was. And then he left. Now that's a man. They shouldn't make a Braveheart movie about him, right? And then, have you ever listened to the guy Paul Harvey? Like the new generation? You probably never heard of him, right? Anybody under 30? Uh, maybe even under 40. Paul Harvey would always say, and the rest of the story. You'd like to hear the rest of the story about this macho, manly man, big, burly chested Theodore Roosevelt. He grew up with really bad asthma, and he was a mother's boy, he stayed home all the time, and he was a little weakling. And his asthma kept him from doing manly things. And then um, uh, he um, made a de defining decision in his life that his physical disposition would not deter his dreams 
And he started working out, doing all kinds of physical exercise and exercise and willpower. But the 100 pound weakling turned into a burly chested man that most people would not mess with. And we can learn a lot from Teddy Roosevelt. No matter where you're at in life, you can overcome it. You can change your lot in life. You can change your stars. You can work hard, right? Uh, if you trust in God, He'll give you the strength to overcome any obstacle. You might be handicapped. You might be a single mother or a senior adult with aches and pains. Everybody on the back row said, Amen. Yeah. <laughs> but you can overcome these obstacles and accomplish great things for God. Amen. Will it be easy? No. It's not going to be very, it's, it's going to be very difficult. It'll take hard work and self-denial for possibly years. Another thing I like about Roosevelt is that he had an insatiable curiosity about everything. While he was president of the United States, he read 500 books a year. <clears throat> While fulfilling his duties as the president, studying everything under the sun. He also taught Sunday school and he still had time to play with his kids, played hide and seek in the White House, and he'd make dignitaries wait on him while he played with his kids. So you can be busy and be a great father, too. Isn't that awesome? Teddy Roosevelt worked on himself. You know you can transform your body, you can transform your mind and your spirit. See, he was a Sunday school teacher. Do you think he knew the Bible? Yes! you got to know the Bible if you're a Sunday school teacher. Isn't that awesome that he is a Sunday school teacher, Mike? <clears throat> With God on your side, he can, God can make all of your dreams come true. And I'm not talking about Disney World, that kind of thinking, right? When you wish upon a star. My wife likes it when I sing from the pulpit. <laughs> I'm not talking about when you wish upon a star. I'm talking about in a practical sense. This is how our God works. He works in practical ways. <clears throat> Where you do the work, God implants the vision, the drive, the motivation, an occasional miracle, right? And then you take the risks, the outrageous risks, and you make huge sacrifices. In that sense, he will make your dreams come true. I left out not quitting when you fail. Because we're going to fail. Christians, we're going to fail. Christians, we're going to fail. And, and you're probably not going to hear that from a lot of TV preachers. But I'm telling you what, God uses failure to, to take you to the next level. Amen. If you don't quit. Oh, I'm never starting a business again. I lost my shirt. Right. Man, man, I once bit twice shot, I'm not gonna start a business again. Or or someone with God on their side would say, Hey, man, I learned so much from that failure. I'm gonna start another business. I'm sure I can make it work this time. With God, all things are possible, right? God always causes you to sacrifice more than you're comfortable with. God always makes you work harder than you ever thought you could work. God makes you take risks sacrifices and God comes through for you it's like when God gave the promised land to the Israelites do you remember that God said I got a, a, a land flowing with milk and honey great God take us okay I'm gonna take you out of slavery we're gonna wander in the desert and then we're gonna go into the promised land and then God says oh but there's there's your enemies in the promised land they're all in cities I'm, they're yours but you're gonna have to go to war and fight these people and drive them out. But the land is yours. You go in the name of the Lord and I'll be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And the people had to fight for the promised land. Are we going to be any different? God makes his people fight. you always got to work for what's good, don't you? Every good thing. A family is a good thing. Having a good family is a great blessing. But I'll tell you what, you're going to have to fight for that family. Having a wife who will stand by you through thick and thin is the greatest thing on earth. But you're going to have to fight for that woman. Because the devil's going to try to break you up and destroy your family. He wants your kids on drugs. He wants 
He wants to destroy you, but you're going to have to fight for what's worth it. Amen? And listen, some things are worth fighting for. Amen. Your family is worth fighting for. Fathers, your children are worth fighting for. Fathers, you shouldn't let a morning or a night go by that you don't tuck your kids into bed and read them a story. Because I'll tell you what, that's probably the best thing you can do to your children is just being there. Just being there. Right? They spell love, T-I-M-E, right? Time, man. Be there with them. For Jonathan, my son, he's 21 now. For the first 10 years of his life, I laid in bed with him every night and read him books and told him stories for 10 years. I never missed, maybe except if I was out of town on a trip. But I, can I tell you something? It's paid off in spades. That's right, yeah. I was young, right? And I could have been running around with my friends. But no, I said there's something really important that I'm going to fight for and I'm going to make sure I do a good job of being a father. I'm going to lay down a little job and read the Lord of the Rings to him. You ever tried to read the Lord of the Rings out loud? <laughs> It is hard, man. It's like reading King James like times two. It's, it's so hard. And, and sometimes when Jonathan, he was like five, I'd read him something. I'd say, Jonathan, did you understand that? He'd say, no. <laughs> no, I don't understand that. I keep reading. But, you know, even the Israelites, listen to this. The Israelites had to fight battles. And even the Israelites lost battles. Even the Israelites lost battles. There's a, there's a town, a city called Ai, A-I. And they had just taken Jericho. It was their second big battle. And, and so they go, hey, man, we just defeated uh, Jericho, the biggest city with the biggest walls. God was with us. And yet Achan sinned and stole some of the gold. And it was all, all supposed to go into the, the uh, temple, the tabernacle. And he stole it. And God allowed them to lose and lose hundreds, maybe thousands of men died. And they suffered a big defeat. What, do you, what does defeat do to a Christian? Makes you reevaluate. Makes you wonder, is there sin in my life? And there was sin in the camp. And they had to find Achan, right? And they had to deal with sin in their lives. Maybe sometimes, hey, when you fail, you need to stop, reconsider, and you need to look in your life. Is there sin in the camp? Is there sin in the camp? Right? Things are happening to you. Maybe it's a series. Don't you know bad things come in threes? Have you noticed? Three things, three bad things are happening to you. You need to stop, drop, and pray. Say, Holy Spirit, show me. Am I, am I sinning? Is there things happening in my life? If the Holy Spirit, He might say, No, you're not sinning. You're not, you're not in pornography. and You're not doing drugs. You're not cheating on your husband. You're not doing all this stuff. The Holy Spirit will show that to you. Let me tell you, if you are sinning, He'll show that to you. You're abusive. You're an abusive, mean person. I'm not to knock you upside the head. Okay, Lord, I'll stop being abusive. You know, the Holy Spirit will tell you right from wrong. So when things start happening, you always stop and pray. Always stop and pray. Sometimes God says, "No, you keep on going strong. I'm just testing you. Keep on going strong." Let's look at the life of Joshua. Turn to Joshua one one. This is so great. Okay, as we read this, I want you to think about something. Men are emotional. Okay. Some men are emotional wrecks. But none of you here are. So. Joshua 1.1. 1, 1, and I love this. Read this with, with God looking at Joshua and thinking about his emotions for a minute. Okay. God is concerned about how we handle things and how we're just dealing with stuff and our fears, our anxieties, God's concerned about that. So Joshua installed as a leader. So after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. He said, Moses, my dear, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all the people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert uh, to Lebanon and from the great river the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. How encouraging is that word? <laughs> I'm about to give you a huge, huge land and 
no one's going to stand against you. He's building them up, right? Okay. As I was with as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. How's that? Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Then he says again, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the left or the right, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not, have I, have I, the great I am, not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Why do you think he said that phrase three times already? Because this great leader, Joshua, who's fought many battles, many battles, he was the one down there fighting when Moses was on top of the mountain with Aaron and Hur on one side and holding up his hands. This guy was a warrior. He was the brave heart of his day. Why did God have to tell him three times, be strong and courageous? Because even strong men lose heart. And even strong men get afraid. And even strong men go into valleys of depression. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Even strong men get discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Man. Man. Even strong men need encouragement. Even Jesus needed encouragement. Remember when the Father, when he, Jesus got baptized? I mean, Jesus was fully God and fully man. And he gets baptized, comes up out of the water, there's a voice from heaven that said, this is my Son whom I love and whom I am well pleased. <laughs> Even Jesus needed affirmation and encouragement from his Father. Fathers, how much more do your children need love and affirmation? Some of you fathers here today probably need to go home and get on the phone and call your daughter and say, Honey, I probably haven't told you this enough, but I really am proud of you and I love you. Some of you fathers might need to go home today and call your son on the phone. Maybe you need to make a little trip and see him face to face. Probably the greatest thing my father ever did for me was to tell me that he loves me. Some of you might have been brought up old school and you didn't hug. And you weren't emotional. You're from that generation that didn't hug and slap them on the back. was real tough with your children. Can I tell you something, fathers? That's okay for, for a little bit of the time. Oftentimes your kids need a hug. They need love and tenderness. Fathers, we can be tender with our children. I hope you're tender with your wife. Right? You're a tough dude, but don't always be tough, right? You're, we're going to raise great little men, right? We're going to raise great little men, but there's times, fathers, many times you need to just put your arm around your boy and say, I love you. I love you. Do you hear that? I love you. I'm proud of you. You're my boy. You're my girl. I'm proud of you, girl. How many ladies in this room would have wished your fathers would have done that to you? Say, man, I wish my father... Would have just once told me that he loved me. And I, this is God encouraging Joshua. Uh, just encouraging Joshua. Because even strong men, amen, need encouragement. So the secret to success and prosperity is found right here in this ancient text. He said if you do these things, you'll be successful and prosperous. The secret is being strong and courageous and not getting discouraged. Okay? If you're going to be a businessman, if you're going to make it in the Air Force, if you're going to be a combat controller, you've got to be strong and courageous, right? <laughs> I mean, that kind of, kind of goes without saying. But what if, what if you want to be strong and courageous and you're not? What if you're just a lover and not a fighter? Any men here? Yeah, I might look big on the outside, but I'm really a, a little sheep on the inside. I'm a lover. I love people. I love things. I don't like confrontation. Well, how do you get courage if you don't have courage? It's right here in the text. Right here in the text. What is it? Go to the next. You got another one? The secret is what he said. A, realize God is with you. Now, that's a great encouragement. 
no matter where you go or what you say, you might go to a new base. I'm going to my new base. God is already there waiting for you. He's got a house ready for you. He's got everything waiting. So don't be afraid. You go there. Be strong and praying. What's another one? What's B? Realize God is with you and meditate on the word day and night and obey it. Those are the two, two things God said to do. Men, the secret to your success, the secret for being strong and courageous is in God's word. God's book is not like any other book ever written. You're not going to get strong and courageous by reading the whole Harry Potter series. I'm serious. You're not going to get strong and courageous by reading the Lord of the Rings as much as I like it. There's a supernatural book that when you digest it in your mind will put things in you like courage and strength and love and peace and patience. So the devil's going to keep you from God's Word. He doesn't want you to have the fruit of the Spirit operating in your life. He wants you to go off the handle. Right? I found as a Christian, it's easy to, to be, to, to act good. It's a lot harder to react. And it, and it, it's easier to, to, to be good than to react good. <laughs> when someone cuts you off in traffic, what's the first thing you do? That shows you your spiritual maturity right there. When your wife disses you, disrespect. That's what they talk about in prison. Disrespect. <laughs> they disrespect me. I'm going to show them what's up. I got to knock down and get my respect back. That's the way they think in the world, right? And so when someone disrespects you, do you fly off of the handle and say, I'm going to knock his head off? Then you're very... Emotionally unstable. No, you're very emotionally <laughs> immature. Spiritually, you're immature. Spiritually, if you can't control your swear words by now, you need to get God's Word in your heart more. It's the Word of God transforming your mind and your heart that's going to change you into the image of Christ. You're where you are today because of the lack of reading of God's Word. Do you know that what you don't know can hurt you? Because you don't read the Word, you have no power of God in your life. Because you don't read and you don't pray. I'll tell you, something happens when you read God's Word. It changes you from the inside out. First of all, you get born again. Here's how you transform. Some women, you better nudge your husband and say, Buddy, you better start transforming. <laughs> I remember one time, I don't remember, but my grandfather was an alcoholic. He was in his, in his 20s. And my mother had two baby girls, and he was going down drinking too much. And she said, Jim, you better get down to church and get saved, or we're leaving you. And she meant it. So what did Jim do? He went down to church and got saved. <laughs> and saved their marriage. We better transform, and here's how you do it. You go to the altar and give your heart to the Lord. God starts with your heart. He doesn't try to stop your smoking, stop your cussing, stop your drinking, your pornography. He doesn't deal with these issues. He goes right to the heart of the matter because when you get a new heart implanted by God, you won't want to smoke it. You won't want to do drugs. You won't want to run around on your wife. You won't want to steal things. You won't want to talk trash anymore. You don't want to cuss anymore because you're a new person from the inside. So God says, hey, it's time for a heart transplant. And then we will work together to transform your life. The Holy Spirit working with the Word of God that you're reading. If you're not reading the Word of God, He can't use it. You've got to put it in there so the Holy Spirit can use it and transform your life, man. Some, some men need to better, they better start hurrying up on the transformation process. It just doesn't happen because you come to church. I wish it did. Emotional our spiritual maturity just doesn't happen. You've got to make it happen with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. God said to the woman at the well, my father is look, looking for worshipers who will worship me in spirit and in truth. You, you leave out the spirit. You leave out the spirit and all you got is truth. You're going to have a, a church that's legalistic. It'll be just religion. If you leave out the Word and all you have is the Spirit, you're going to have a crazy charismatic church where everybody's running around praying for each other, casting demons out of everybody because you've run out of things to do. 
I've been to those churches. They're crazy. They're fun. But they're crazy. <laughs> spirit, spirit and truth. My men of God, you've got to get the spirit and the truth. Let me ask you if you'll bow your heads today. How many would say to me, Pastor, you're preaching to me. I'm not really serving the Lord. I'm just kind of living a secular lifestyle. But I believe in God. But your lifestyle doesn't show it. But you're, you're here today hearing this sermon and you're hearing a challenge. It needs to be more than religion. It needs to be a relationship with a transformed life. How many raise your hand and say, Pastor, you're talking to me. I need you to pray for me. If you lift your hand, let me pray for you. Nobody's looking around. Yes, I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. Anybody else? I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but I tell you, today's the day to change, to allow God's Holy Spirit to change your heart. Yes, I see a hand. I see a hand on the front. I may even say to me, Pastor, you know, there was a day that I used to walk with the Lord. I got real busy with life, children, family, business, my, my vocation, career. And I kind of started neglecting the things of God kind of walked away. I'm ready to get back tight with the Lord and start serving Jesus again. How many raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me? Yes, I see a hand. Anybody else? Yes, I see a hand. Anybody else? Yes, yes, I see a hand. God knows your heart. He knows you're serious. God knows you're serious. You're ready to make a commitment to the Lord. It's been my experience to know God is to love God. He's so great. You can't help but love Him. Everything He does is for our, our good, our best interests. Like Julie said earlier, you might have had a father that wasn't a good father. But we have a heavenly father who is a perfect father. And if you can't really look for your, to your earthly father, you can always look to your heavenly father. How many would like to have a relationship with your Heavenly Father today? Raise your hands. I want to pray for you. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. God loves you so much. He wants to have a real relationship with you. A vibrant, passionate relationship. That's awesome. Let's just pray. Will you pray with me today? Say, Dear Lord Jesus. Say it out loud. Say, Dear Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me as white as snow. Cast my sin in the sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west. Remember my sin no more. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Adopt me into your family. I give my life to you. Entirely to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.